all those things that God has given you, the beautiful ways he's designed you, he did that with very specific purpose, with his like kingdom mission in mind, which is to love him and to love others. The way he made you was intended to bring glory to him, to love him, to worship him, and to love others. Unfortunately, we have been born on earth after the fall. And as a result of that, from the moment of your creation, the enemy who is out to steal, kill, and destroy has been after you from that moment to misshape you, to distort you. I'm shaking. I'm so excited. (laughs) Um, To distort you to do everything he can to prevent you from being how God designed you to be, to do everything he can to keep you from loving God and everything he can to keep you from loving others. So that's depressing. But it doesn't stop there, right? And I think you would know that it doesn't stop there, but you might not know that it doesn't stop there. Um, And so what we're going to do today is you can go ahead and switch to um, the verse is we're going to look at like what does the bible actually have to say about that about what's happening with that and what we're supposed to do with that what are we supposed to do with that we've been made a certain way and then out of mostly no control of our own we've been beat up and um, molded and shaped and and distorted in ways that god hadn't had planned for us Um, and so what scripture says is this says Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world. And that phrase isn't talking like gravity. It's talking about a spiritual thing happening inside. Um, It's talking about anything opposed to God. Like, do not be conformed to anything opposed to God. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So there, that's the answer. You were created beautifully. You've been beat up. Now go and do that. Okay, we're good? All right, the worship team can come up. <laughs> <We're done. laughs> no, no. Um, unfortunately, like for me, for a really long time, that is actually what I thought about this verse. I thought, I have to, I have to do it. I got to not be conformed, and I got to be transformed, and then I got to go know God's will. But out of the context of all of Scripture, that's what it sounds like. And even kind of missing some of the Greek translation, um, the fullness of that language, that's what it sounds like. Um, But when you look at it in all of Scripture and all the things that from beginning to end, what this is more saying is do not be conformed to the pattern of the world, um, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Mean be inwardly transformed by the power of God. It's not actually something you can do yourself. The word renewal is actually a a renewal that is powered by God. Very different thing. So our hope today as we share our personal stories is to kind of give like real life examples, the religious words testimony, of like this being true for us um, and how those spaces in us that we have where we're stuck and we can't seem to love others well or love God well because we're just stuck and we just keep bumping up against them, those places are places that we were actually conformed and we need God's power to come in and change in us. All right, so you tracking? Does it sound good? All right, Mm -hmm. okay. All right, so Jill, let's go ahead and start with you. Can you tell us about like a time you were stuck? What that looked like, what it felt like, how it impacted your ability to not love well? Yes. So... I'm going to share really a recent thing that's happened in my life. And so just to kind of, before I even share this, I want to be really open uh, that this is something I am still very much in the middle of. Uh, So it does not mean, you know, I'm not looking back and I'm like, oh, I've, you know, God has totally redeemed this certain situation in my life. Um, He has definitely been part of it, uh, but I am not necessarily on the other side looking back. Um, I'm still kind of, well, I'm not kind of, I am still in it. Uh, And so uh, just to share a little bit about what that journey has looked like for me, uh, about 
Oh, I would say in the last few years, probably the last eight years, uh, my family has been going through um, a pretty significant metal, medical crises. Um, and that really culminated about two to three years ago um, when my mother was uh, very, very sick in the hospital. She was in the hospital for about three months. Um, I was called in to say goodbye to her at least two or three times. It was a really, really scary season. Uh, and thankfully, she is actually um, still alive. Like, there are great things about this story, actually miracles related to her healing. Um, but in that, uh, it was very difficult for me personally. And I don't think I even realized it until about oh, I'd say two months after she got home, life was supposed to be back to normal, right? Like, hey, she's better, things are better, we should just keep moving on. And instead, it was almost like my body said, nope, that was really scary, that was really hard, and we're not moving forward from that right now. And so what happened physically was I started having a lot of panic attacks. Um, they started out slow. I had like one, and then like two months later, I had another one. Um, but speed up about eight months, and I'm literally living in like constant fight or flight. Um, what, what my doctor said was that my brain was dysregulated. Um, and that's a, you know, that's great to hear that term like, okay, now I know what's wrong, but I had absolutely zero, I had no idea how to fix this. Um, and I'm a psychologist, so I felt like I should know how to fix this. I did not. And uh, so where I really realized that I was the most stuck, I mean, I'm trying everything. I'm reading books. I'm trying all these different things. I'm going to God. I mean, I, I never let up going to God in this, but about a year and a half ago, we were actually up in northern Wisconsin at a family camp. And we had just spent the whole day together as a family. We had actually gone skiing for the first time. Uh, my kids and I, Tyler and I are not great skiers, we learned. Um, and we had had this fantastic day. And we're at uh, the worship service that night. Family, it's like a Christian family camp. And we're at this worship service. And my kids are by me. Um, it's an amazing speaker. We're worshiping and panic just washes over me and I have a panic attack in the middle of the service and I have to leave. And I remember going back to our cabin and I'm just laying on the bed thinking I'm gonna die because anytime I have a panic attack, my brain immediately goes to you're going to die right now. Um, you're very unsafe and I'm sitting there and I'm like, I, something like, I can't do this on my own anymore. Like. God, like I'm at rock bottom. And what I realized, not only was I stuck like kind of with these, the, this panic, but it was now impacting my family. Like I was no longer as present with my kids. I wasn't able to even really worship in the same way. Like I, I was at a really low point. And I think it was being in that moment, recognizing here I am at this, basically I'm on vacation and I should be at this great, you know, service, worshiping with my family, and I'm stuck in a room by myself, you know, my heart's racing, and I'm not present with my kids in this moment. And yeah. so uh, that's really where I realized I was the most stuck. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing. How about you, David? Well, I thought about it. I, I went back a ways because I thought, when I was the most stuck? I, many times I've been stuck, but the most stuck, I think, was when I was early in our marriage, um, most of you have heard the story, uh, but maybe you haven't heard underneath what was going on. But uh, early in our marriage, we were trying to have children, and we were fighting infertility. And it's really uh, wiped out Debbie at a level that was not what we'd ever experienced in our marriage. She was just fighting to hang in there, to keep perspective, to, to kind of keep the darkness away. And I made a really... I remember thinking, okay, this is time to step up, be the husband, be strong. And I remember just deciding I'm going to go really hard. I'm going to try to, you know, help my wife. And and uh, and uh, I kind of put my emotions aside. I, I began trying to help her. And uh, and ironically, as much as I tried, um, it didn't seem it. Not that she wasn't glad I was 
it wasn't kind to her, but it wasn't seeming to help her much at all. In fact, the more I tried, it felt like I couldn't get love across somehow, and I was just I was just doing all I knew how to do the right thing. Do the right thing, David. Do the right thing. And so I remember this went on for numbers of years, and we finally got to a place that it went to a place that we began feeling like, okay, we're, well, adoptions. And we kind of thought, well, that would be easier, but it wasn't. Uh, the adoptions, it got worse. And every time it got worse, we had numbers of adoptions that fell through. Um, uh, if you've ever been through adoption stuff, there's a, quite a ride emotionally, and we had a lot of crashes, more than most. And I kept saying, oh, God, I'm trying to hang in here. And uh, every time we had a hit, I went, it took a notch out of us. It just kind of took us down to another place of despair. And, uh, and we were trying to hang in there, and I realized I, I was just at a place that I was... I realized I don't have whatever it takes to do this. And I thought, if we could just get a kid in here, just a baby, just do something, change the circumstance. And, uh, but I just, nothing, nothing seemed to get better. And I was just, I just didn't know. And I was trying to love Debbie. And I, I was, I loved her in a sense, but I couldn't seem to effectively love her. And that's where I stuck. And you had mentioned um, when we talked about it a little bit before, like you had a hard time with any kind of direct feeling about it, like emotional feelings. Well, I, I actually decided that, you know, you got two people who are swirling down the toilet, you know, you think well, that's not good. So I will, I will, if Debbie's going downstream and getting pulled away, I will be the strong person and hold on to her. That's my mindset. And so I would always say, well, Someone has to keep their feet on the ground and do the right thing and hold in there. And so that's what, that was my mindset of that's how I was going to love her was that. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. How about you? Um, yeah, for me, I had a person in my family growing up who was um, verbally abusive, sometimes physically abusive, and it was really awful, as you can imagine. And um, as an adult, I went to counseling and I was following God and we did all these like exercises to process and name pain and all these things because she was talking about how important it was for me to get to a place of forgiveness. And then, you know, you hear in church how important it is to get to a place of forgiveness. And so that's what I was trying to pursue. And I received so much healing in counseling, like it was an essential thing I needed. And I'm so grateful for God's gift of a good counselor. Um, but I still just couldn't get to forgiveness because I would just still, like anything related to this person, like hearing their name or a random thing that would make me think of them, I would like bristle internally. And it would become this like internal battle of like, no, no, I've forgiven that person. I've forgiven them. And it would just feel really hard. And then I also had two memories in particular about this person that I was just haunted by. The most random thing could make the memory pop up and it would just kind of ruin my whole day because I'd be actively trained not to remember it all day long. It would make me just maybe irritable to my family, um, mostly my families who got the brunt of it, like my, my family now, um, because it would just take me out because I didn't want to think about it. And so I just, it just wasn't, nothing, I was stuck. It was just stuck. Mm -hmm. It's the best way to describe it. So let's not leave it in the stuck. <laughs> you want to go first, David? To share how you got yeah. unstuck and, and did being unstuck change your ability to love? Yeah, I, I, um, we had gotten to a place that we literally, we were just, it just felt like a very narrow view trying to survive. And, um, uh, and we used to say, I didn't know Satan's leash was this long. That's what we used to say. <laughs> like, we're getting torn up here. And, uh, so in the middle of all that, we'd had these adoptions fall through, but then we got the call that brought us great joy. We got a call. There's a gal that um, felt clear that she was supposed to uh, have us as the birth parents. And we got a call from our lawyer, and I picked up the phone, and he said, hey, uh, you have a baby girl, and the mother's signed all the paperwork, and we're going to be delivering her to your house. And so we... We got everybody involved, and then we got a call back, and they said, the mother's come back in the hospital, changed her mind, and the baby's not yours. But 
in that middle time, I felt for the first time. So, a lot of years ago, but I can, I can remember how it felt like. It was like, I couldn't do it anymore. I, I just, I thought, we're gonna, Debbie and I are going to have to go down the, the tubes together. We're, we're, we're just, we're just done. I'm done. And I couldn't, I had no more mustering strength at all. And I don't even really quite remember what happened. I had a bit of a breakdown. I do remember the next morning, we were in a different town. They took us to where my parents had a house on some land. And we got up and we went for a walk. And I could feel this weight of, of everything. But Deb and I began talking. And strangely enough, we reconnected. And I understood there that what I needed to be was to be able to be emotionally present. And I, I couldn't do it before. And that was the start of it. But then it was a long process of understanding what that meant and how that changed. It wasn't like, ding. It was like, in fact, I started thinking about this. I think it was maybe two years later, right before we were praying for a baby again at a prayer meeting that I broke down and began letting God in. <laughs> so it wasn't like I just got it right away, but I began letting God in to my pain. And uh, then we uh, had amazingly had our, our, our daughter, but even then, as we went out to California with Emily and then we got a lease and we're doing so well in so many circumstances, God was still doing the same thing. And I had prayer after prayer helping me unpack lots of things that I could, have not, I could not get a hold of to show me what I, how I was made and I was being able to... Um, to, to uh, see, I understood and I was able to emotionally connect. And, uh, and it's changed, I mean, it's, it's changed everything, actually. It's changed my relationship with Debbie. It changed my relationship with my girls, which I realize now emotional connections is going to be very important with all we went through. And, and I remember and with my grandkids, with people in the church, um, it just has changed. You know, I, I'm known for crying now, <laughs> but so I'm probably, you know, I'm still in process, but I'm just telling you it's, it's the best feeling in the world. And see, there's a vineyard person. And so uh, um, it's the best feeling in the world because it's where God comes. You know, the worst spot is where God comes. So been it's been good it's still uh, like you i would say though i would say it's still something god's doing even more in i'm not done i i feel like there's more but i'm um, certainly at a different spot so for you you were kind of um like the way that the world conformed you was that like you it was up to you to be strong and to hold things together yeah like that was kind of how you had been shaped to believe and where god got you through these in these like supernatural encounters through prayer with people through one-on-one -on -one times with him right that is actually where you were he was able by his power to shift your thinking and see like no david i actually i want to come in this with you and i want to show you how to be in it yeah. fully with others. Yeah, I think that probably the, in, again, since I'm up here all the time, you hear these things a lot, but I think probably the, the moment that it, if, you, if you would put a picture to what it was, I was in a, being prayed for when I was in California at the Vineyard, which that was all new to me back then, the being prayed for and everything, but I was taking it in like crazy, and uh, people were praying for me, and I had this very vivid image of, of me being in the water, and there's this big tall pier, and my father was standing on the pier with a great confidence and a smile looking at me. And I was paddling to keep my head above water. It just not knowing how to swim. But eventually, I, you know, that place of dog paddling, you start realizing I'm, I can do this. And I remember looking at my father and he's just so beaming because he knew I could do it. My father, my father always believed him and gave me a thumbs up. And in that dream, everybody who was praying for me was so devastated because my father wasn't in the water <laughs> with me and I never even thought it being a possibility mm -hmm. and so that was a visual picture of how I had a father who believed in me but I didn't know how to let him into pain mm -hmm. but I knew he'd stay with me mm -hmm. 
but from a distance. And that changed that. And that changed the way I look at people. That's really beautiful. Thank you. Jill, do you want to share how God is unsticking you and how it changes how you love those around you? Yeah. So I'm going off script a little bit here, but uh, which is why I didn't bring my notes up. So I think this is good. God uh, told her not to bring her notes up. <laughs> he told me not to bring my obedient. notes up. <laughs> but I, I really... So having anxiety was, is not something new to me. Uh, that's something I've dealt with pretty much all of my life. I remember being a very young child um, and having anxiety. And to my parents' credit, they really tried to help me. Um, I mean, way before, you know, back, back then people didn't really get help for things like that. And they really tried. Um, and I had a lot of tools in my tool belt, if that makes sense, to help me cope. And that did me really well for a long time and there's nothing wrong with those tools i'm so thankful for them i still use them today uh, but this experience of really not being able to control um, this anxiety and panic it took me to a whole new level of surrender to jesus because i had like i I literally had nothing I could muster on my own. Um, everything I had done before had been me kind of pulling myself up from my bootstraps. Okay, I'm going to do this X, Y, and Z, and that'll make me be able to function and do okay. And and it was I I, I couldn't do that anymore. Like it was to the point where all of those things were failing me, um, and so really it started me on this journey of recognizing more and more uh, my reliance on Jesus but even more than that I had some kind of not kind of I had deep-seated narratives and truths that I was believing that were not accurate um, and so it took I mean you mentioned you went to counseling uh, and through my counseling journey and through prayer with other people here at Vineyard uh, but primarily through my counseling journey, I have recognized that I, I trusted Jesus in a lot of areas. I would have told other people to trust Jesus in a lot of areas. Uh, but when it came down to certain things in my life, and again, this is a work in progress. I am not on the other side looking back. I'm still very much processing this. But I was not fully trusting him. Uh, particularly as it related to my family and particularly as it related to like me as a parent like I want to parent my kids and I want to be there for them and there were some things I had experienced growing up and then the almost threat of losing my parents that just had these deep-seated no I want to be in control of this like Jesus I'll give you everything else but I want this one thing. Mm -hmm. and, and so honestly, like I said, I'm still very much still trying. Like, I'm not even like, it's not even like a trying. It's just like, okay, God, like, I need you to be in this with me and continue to help me as I'm, I'm, I'm handing this over to you. Um, and it's a, it's a really slow process. Uh, and it hasn't necessarily been easy. Um, but one of the one of the parts of this question, or and even going back to Romans 12 too, um, is this idea of renewing my mind. And I think there's a lot of power in, in our thoughts. Mm -hmm. And the last two years have made me realize even more how much power there is in our thoughts. And my thoughts can easily spiral like like that and a drop of a hat. I don't know if you guys have ever experienced that. Um, and, and so something that has been really helpful to me uh, is just meditating on scripture. Even if at that moment, I'm, I know I'm like half-heartedly believing it, but I'm, tr you know, I'm like giving it to God. And so the biggest one that has been helpful to me um, is Psalm I wrote it on my hand so I wouldn't forget 53.6. I was going to say 63, so I'm glad I looked at my hand. That was kind uh, of like a note. It is so. kind of like a note. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, when I am afraid, I will put my trust in you. 
because I, I, I am afraid, and yet, God, I need to put my trust in you. And then um, Proverbs um, 3, 5, uh, trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding. And I so easily want to lean on my own understanding. I want to reason it all out. I want to understand why God has done X, Y, and Z and make sense of it and have this really pretty picture of, okay, God, this is why you did all of this. And that's not actually mine to understand always. And so just really trying to re just give him my thoughts mm -hmm. and, and just pray that he's going to continue to do a work. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm really hopeful for that. Yeah. Like I, I'm actually, and I remember talking to David about this like almost two years ago. So this is a long journey. I'm not through it. But I remember telling him, when I'm anxious, it's actually making me, like this suffering is bringing me closer to Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I can say now two years later, it's actually brought me even more closer to Jesus. And I'm actually in ways thankful for it. I don't wish it on anyone. I don't want, you know, I don't want you to have that. Um, but through that experience, he has made me become more and more reliant on him. Yeah. And so I have hope that one day this won't be my story. You know, I can look back and say, oh, you know, I'm not, I'm not struggling with anxiety anymore. Or, I fully trust him 100% in every area, including this specific area with my kids. Um, but until then, I, I am thankful that he has been so, so much a part of this journey. So um, even though you're still very much in the thick of it, like you've yeah. said, um, which I really appreciate you being willing to share in the thick of something, because I think that's an especially vulnerable place to be. Do you have like one way that you've seen yourself, like the things that he has healed, right? Because you have mentioned there's been progress, even though they're in the thick, there has been stuff that God is doing in you. Have you noticed um, like any way that it's changed how you're better able to love others, whether it's in your family or anywhere, really? Yes, definitely. I'm glad you asked because that was part of the question I did not respond to. Uh, yeah, so I, I will say that this experience has made me so much more compassionate toward those around me. Um, so like I, I mentioned, I think in the first question, uh, my background and my training is as a psychologist. And so I have a lot of head knowledge when it comes to topics like anxiety. Um, and I even had a little bit of an understanding because it was something I had dealt with as a kid. But I didn't have a box for that moment where it was to the point where somebody's not functioning or to the point where somebody couldn't just kind of pick them up themselves up from their bootstraps and move on because I had always been able to do that in the past and so this experience has given me more empathy and compassion and just a heart for others and uh, that I that I did not have previously I mean I, I kind of had it like I wanted to have it I wanted to be empathetic I wanted to understand but I didn't fully understand because I, I had not truly experienced that depth. Um, and, and so it, it has given me a, a lot more compassion for those around me. Yeah. That's great. Um, How about you? Yeah, so I'm going to, for sake of time, try to squeeze mine up. <laughs> um, but for me, like I would say, like, having done like learned all the tools and things that I got through counseling they were really helpful but it was really a managing and managing takes effort <laughs> and I would discover when I was really tired or depleted in any way or circumstances got really hard I was losing the ability to do a man like manage kind of that hurt and the pain I was still had and it would show up in like blowing up <laughs> being not very nice, really angry, being judgmental, like all the things that we've been talking about through Love University, it's like not the right thing to do. Those would just come out of me. Um, and so I had just gotten to this place where I was like, I'm just resigned to this. I'm just resigned. I'm going to have to have these memories forever that will haunt me forever. And I'm going to just have to do my best to like act like a forgiving person. <laughs> and that was kind of, I don't know, it was sad. It's sad to be resigned. Um, and disappointing. Um, but God, I started receiving um, a manual prayer, which is a 
healing practice we have here in the church. And um, through that process of regularly encountering God, Jesus, Holy Spirit, Jesus did something I thought he could never, ever do. Like, really, like I had set my mind to being stuck for till I died and went to heaven with these issues. And through his Jesus y, like, amazingly brilliant way, which I don't have time to tell you all about, but would love to if you want to hear it, you can find me some other time. Um, he took, he met me in those places of pain, and he took that pain and he actually healed it. I mean, like, all the way healed it. Like, healed it to the point now, like, when I think of those memories, I think, oh, wish that had ever happened to me. That's awful. But none of the pain comes rushing back as if it's happening right now. It's like, oh, there's this, there's this thing that happened, and they rarely haunt me. In fact, I like, oh, let me tell you about the time. <laughs> and like, what amazes me about that is Martha was actually the person praying for me with one of these memories. And at the end, like, she's doing everything, and I just start bawling so hard I can't even talk. And she's just trying to check in with me, make sure I'm okay. Like, are you? And I couldn't even, I couldn't even tell her I was okay. I was cr I crying so hard. And when I finally got to the place where I could tell her what was going on, she looked a little concerned, like, oh, I hope you're doing, you know, like, when someone cries that hard, it's, it's, it's weird, it's, and you don't want them to hurt. And what I had to try to communicate is, like, it's not hurt. Like, what happened at the end of, like, that time, this prayer time with Jesus, is that he actually took my heart, and it was like he gave me a piece of his for this person that hurt me. And I'm telling you, when I bawled for those five minutes, it was with heartbreak for this person absolute heartbreak like just sobbing for the pain and it was like he let me see how jesus let me see how he saw this person mm -hmm. didn't take away the damage this person had done with me he didn't dismiss that that in fact jesus told me it was wrong right but he gave me this place and like i i didn't even have to say i forgive you the forgiveness was just there i knew it was there because now and i still feel it just so much compassion for this person like i pray for them regularly with a very sincere heart i don't have a story that like oh magically reconciled they're still not a safe person but i'm able to pray for them instead of mm -hmm. um well really it was hate for a long time and like how i would say how did that change like my my ability to love like with god how it changed it is like wow god you're amazing you love me so much you healed me of that you're able to do that like i just i just love him and maybe it's a selfish love because it's like thanks for healing me i love you so much but it's true like when he did like my my faith in him my trust in him i just love him so much and then like in terms of like other people like outside of this particular person is like Oh my goodness. Like, I so want everybody to know the Jesus that I know. Like, that's, I think, the, the gift of loving others that yeah. it's given me. I really want everyone to know the Jesus that I know. Um, and I'm willing to get, like, more weird about it now, so. Yeah. It's not really hard for you. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's my short version. Um, what I'd like to kind of end us with um, is maybe share like through this journey of spiritual transformation that God's done in you, what's like the thing you know that you know that you know that you know that you could share with them that you've learned from God as he has given you, like, right, has transformed your thinking. Um, yeah. Either one of you can go. go. Yeah. Uh, God is faithful. He has been so faithful to me in this process. Uh, even whenever I had no idea what to do, he was faithful, and he, he is in this journey and this suffering with me. And so I know that I know that he is faithful. I mean, for me, I, I know that he loves to be in my pain with me. Not just has to be, but he actually loves to be. And he loves to connect at the deepest ways during those points. But then, I have two things. Yeah, that's okay. I know that. And I also know that he uses evil and good to free me, to allow me to become who he's designed me to be. He's able to go into that pain and not only allow me to feel his presence, he actually is transforming me and getting back to where I'm designed to be 
And so when I look back, I, it's the strangest thing, because if I, in the middle of those times, multiple different times I've been in pain, I've thought to myself, I never, ever, I just want this to go away, I hate this, but I would say that I'm, I, now I wouldn't give that up because of those things. Turn all things to good, right? Yes. Yeah. So mine, what I know that I know that I know, is that Jesus is your solution. Not just in the, like, come to Jesus, let him be your Lord and Savior. That's essential. If you haven't, please do. I encourage you. It'll be the best movie you ever make in your life. But when I say Jesus is your solution, what I mean is he doesn't have your solution. He is your solution. The worry, the pain, the shame, the memories, your past, whatever it is that you're stuck in, because there's a range of stuck, and I have a whole bunch of stuck still. But those, the solution, Jesus, he's it.